Thank you very much. It's, uh, I'm going to present uh, part of the result, but mostly the method, uh, the analytical tool that we used uh, to explore Europeanization of territorial governance and spatial planning. It's uh, something we did uh, in the last five or six years with a colleague of mine, Umberto Janen. It's something we developed uh, in parallel from the ESPUN Compass project, and then we brought it into Compass. And you, you will see if it is convincing or not. Let's see. Let's discuss it together. <coughs> so I will start, uh, this is a brief outline of the paper. I will start to introduce territorial governance and special planning system as institutional technology, then focus a bit on the Europeanization of territorial governance and planning, then focus on uh, downloading influence and domestic change and uploading influence and opportunity for horizontal exchange, and then focus a bit on the main findings and the opportunity for, for, for cross-fertilization between European policy and domestic territorial governance, which was the main aim then. So, a bit of context. What is ESPUN Compass? Well, European Union has been interested in analyzing territorial governance and special planning system in the member state starting since uh, the 90s. This is the compendium of European Union special planning and policies. It depicted only 15 countries, and it depicted this country special planning system as mostly as a static portrait. So, and all, with only superficial attention to the role of the EU in this system. Compass came around 20 years after that. Yeah, the time horizon of the project is 2016, 2018. And it covered all European space, all the ESPON space, plus seven countries, the Balkan countries plus uh, Turkey. It uh, does not provide, the aim is not to provide static pictures, but to provide dynamic pictures of territorial governance and special planning systems, so how they evolved since 2000 until 2016. And what is more important for us, and that's why I present what I present today, is that COMPASS aimed at understanding the role of the European Union in having an impact on the evolution, on the change of territorial governance and special planning systems in the countries of state, and particularly to identify potential good practices on the relation, on the cross-fertilization between domestic territorial governance and special planning system and European Union policies with a territorial relevance. So this is what we try to do. But in order to do that, first of all, we needed to try to find out how to analyze territorial governance and special planning system, not as a statics object, but in their evolution. And for that, <coughs> we use the concept of institutional technologies. For us, territorial governance and special planning is an institutional technology of government, and as every institution, as every technology, is subject to evolutionary processes of innovation. In other words, for trial and error, new solutions are developed and institutionalized into the system. Mm. So basically, like is that every technology and every institution, they evolve through generation of variety in the practice. So while doing things, variety of solution is experimented. Some of these solutions are getting hegemonic yeah, through a discursive process, this, this variety is reduced for competition, mm? and then the solution that become hegemonic get into the system of rules and then get propagated and persist. This is the, how we depict the evolution of territorial governance and special planning system. And this is a diagram that shows it. Mm? And I may have to indicate a bit on the board. I, I don't touch it, I promise, because I've been told not to. Uh, the varieties generated here in the practice realm, when sp specific special planning tools are implemented in places and are implemented in different ways. Yeah? Varieties generated, new approaches, good practices. Yeah? This is debated in the discourse, in the discursive arena of special planning in a specific country. Some experiences are judged more relevant than others, more promising than, than others. And this is the moment when a hinge may form between what are these good practices, so the, the epistemic community discussing them, and the policy networks that then end up taking on board in their policy making and decision making activities some of these solutions and 
institutionally codify them into what we call structure, which is the legal, for legal and institutional framework for special planning and territorial governance to happen. This creates a new status quo of the tools of special planning that then get implemented into new practices and so on and so forth against varieties, against uses and so on. So this is our conceptualization of territorial governance and special planning system as institutional technology that are subjected to evolution. <coughs> of course, this is not enough for understanding how the European Union has an impact on that. Mm? So on, beside that, we also try to study, okay, if we need to study how the European Union has an impact, what is Europeanization? First of all, we understand it not, as a not just as a domestic impact of European Union, but as an interactive process, yeah? a complex logic of co-evolution and adaptation that involve both the domestic context of the member state and the European Union, circular logic involved processes of top-down and bottom-up and horizontal Europeanization. So the question to answer here is not if a nation is more or less Europeanized than, other, uh, than another one, but how the mechanisms of Europeanization works and what are the impact. Mm. <clears throat> so we dig a bit into the literature on Europeanization. We started to study various top-down influences. Mm. The EU that imposes regulatory models where it has specific competencies. The EU that altered the rule of the, ga of the game by providing resources, yeah, economic opportunity, so influencing through economic conditionality. And the EU that indirectly influence national actors by altering their con conviction and, ex and expectation by providing concept, guidance, and so on. So process of cognitive conditionality. But then the other way around, also the member state having an impact on how the European Union develops and evolves, yeah? it's, as I say, it's a process, a process of co-evolution. So the upload of specific topics, of specific devices on the European agenda, and then horizontal influence from countries to countries with the EU that only serve as a platform of interaction. So from this diagram, which is the same diagram as before, for which I took away the time dimension and I made it synchronic with the practices that then are debated in the discourse, institutionally codified in the structure, leading to new tools and they get to new practices, <coughs> we try to add a European Union dimension. So we have the diagram that we had before here, but as we all know, we also have a European discourse on special planning and territorial governance, and this is exactly what we are doing here in ESPON. Yeah? Discussing good practices, mm, presenting handbooks for doing things in a specific way or in another way. Then we have a structure of European Union territorial governance, which is rather weak. There are no special planning competencies, but there is so a social, economic, and territorial cohesion in the treaty, and therefore the EU can do some territorial action. Then we have tools, which are not regular plans, not zoning, no land use, but for instance, European Union regional policies, for instance, integrated territorial investment, for instance, leader, for instance, community led local development. So from this diagram, this is the analytical tool that is the subject of this presentation. We try to understand every possible relation that link European Union and the member state in the field of territorial governance and special planning. And now I'm going to explore with you these links. First, we have what we call structural influence, through which the EU imposes regulatory models to which national devices must adapt. Hmm? This is a process of transposition of European Union rules regulations. So from European Union structure, for instance, strategic environmental assessment, or Nature 2000, or uh, habitat and bird directives, they are directly either imposed or transposed in the member state, and they do have an influence on domestic territorial governance and special planning system. This happens for environment, where you have competence. It happens also for competition. It may happen for transport. It happens for energy, hmm? where the EU has some competences. <coughs> Sorry. Then we have influences from the tools, which are mostly financial resources distributed back from the EU to the member state that have an influence in the practice of special planning in the member state. Why? Because the EU territorial governance practices autonomously from the member state do not exist. European Union tools and incentives are implemented directly in the practice by the member state. And by doing that, they alterate the logic of domestic actors in doing their own practice at home. And therefore may have an influence on how territorial governance and special planning evolve. For instance, if there is cohesion policy, Domestic actors need to take this on board in their domestic practices, and therefore they may change how they do also their regional planning and regional policy at home. <clears throat> A third top-down influence, which we call top-down discursive influence, comes from the European discourse, meaning 
reports coming out from ESPON, but also meeting, for example, European Special Development Perspective of the, territor or the territorial agenda of the EU, or even Europe 2020 strategy. Mm -hmm. So all the documents produced in the European Union, what we call knowledge arena, that may or may not include the concepts that are taken on board in the domestic concept. For whatever reason, for vested interest of domestic actors, or for genuine persuasion that they are good concepts and they are useful in the domestic context. <coughs> so these are the three top-down influences that we explored. We also tried to explore bottom-up influences, which is the uh, first one that I present is bottom-up uh, discursive influence, which is the reverse side of what I just presented. So actors from various domestic contexts that are to influence in European Union discursive arena what are the hot topics on the agenda, what the European Union should deal with in its own cohesion policy, for instance. This happens, uh, for instance, in the National Territorial Cohesion Contact Point or in the urban development groups. Mm. So in this arena, where the main concept of European Union special policy are forged and developed. Mm. Some actors are more powerful than others in, in this arena, some actors are more engaged, and so on and so forth. <coughs> and then we have a last bottom-up influence, which we call practical influence, which is basically, this is really what we're doing in ESPON, so it's European Union discursive arenas that try to understand from domestic practice of implementation of European Union policies and tools, what are good practices. So for instance, integrated territorial investment, in which place are they implemented in an innovative way? So then we can take it on board at the European level and make it a status quo for the new programming period. Mm -hmm. this is a Take an example, of course, there is a lot of reporting going on on the implementation of cohesion policy and all the other initiatives. I don't know how, this, how, the, uh, how the links between this many reports and the influence they have on policy making is working. And apparently, according to the result of the project, not too much, but still. Okay, these are the, four, the five influences. There is still one influence that I mentioned before, which belong to that, which is horizontal. Hmm? So, from practices from specific contexts that are considered good practices, they are elaborated and considered good practice in a European Union discourse document, for instance, a HESPON handbook on territorial governance. Somebody from another state taking on hand and saying, no, this is a very good idea, we have the same problem, why not you try this solution? Hmm? This can happen for HESPON handbooks and report, but may also happen for transnational cooperation platform. Hmm. So the European Union has the great merit to create this platform for which national actors are interacting and sharing knowledge, you know, urban actor from interact. Hmm? Okay, this is the tool that we use to conceptualize the various top-down, bottom-up, and horizontal influences that run from the EU back and forth to the member state and from member state to member state. Then we try to explore those. We try to use this analytical tool in order to explore Europeanization in the ESPON Compass project. So, <coughs> this is just a diagram that summarizes the tool so that you will have it when the presentation is put online. But what are the results? First one is the Europeanization is not an explanation, but it's the explanandum. So basically, it is a problem that needs to be explained. It's not a solution. It's not something like uh, that, uh, okay, counter is Europeanizing, getting homogeneous is a good way. No, Europeanization is something that needs to be found out why it is happening and where it is leading to, because there are no evidences of uh, homogenization of special planning and territorial governance in Europe. Actually, the countries show that these influences are not constant, are not homogeneous, and they vary widely from country to country, by sectors, by channel of influence, and over time. Mm. So this is just to show the complexity of what we found out. You have on the y-axis all the countries, and you have the various channel of influence with all the policy field that may have an influence on countries. And you see if they, they have been assessed as strongly relevant, moderately relevant, lowly relevant or not relevant, and throw time. If between 2000 and 2016, this influence has been mostly increasing, mostly contacts, mostly decreasing, or swinging, yeah? Going back and forth from relevant to not relevant, so being episodic. <coughs> we try to produce map on the basis of that, and we clearly see that based on the top-down influences, there are differences from country to country, 
what has been more influenced. Some countries uh, reputed that uh, like transposition of environmental legislation has been the most influential in, in changing how territorial governance and spatial planning work. Some other countries consider the European Union cohesion policy has been the most influential in provoking changes. Some other countries say that the ESDB has been one pivotal document that led to revival of national strategic planning and programming planning at the national level. So countries to countries, a lot of changes. But generally speaking, top-down influences are more evident, stronger means probably more evident, more easily recognizable than bottom-up influences. Because on the one hand, you analyze one to one relation, so European Union to one single member state. On the other hand, when you analyze bottom-up influence, you have to understand 28 to one relations, so to, to enter the competitive game through which European Union agenda gets formed. Still, the impact of legislation is more uniform according to the respondent to our survey, in the sense that transposition must happen, hmm, and must happen in a specific way. The impact of policies is more varied, and somehow it relates to the magnitude of the financial means. So in countries that receive more money, the impact is reported to be greater. Hmm. In countries that receive less money, the, the impact is reported to be minimal. <clears throat> and the impact of the discourse, of course, because of its application, is, is drawing from it, is completely voluntary, is even more variegated. But what is interesting is that anyway, no homogenization of the responses to EU stimuli has been found out. No homogenization at all. Because the peculiar domestic tradition and culture of special planning, that are the other part of the ESPON Compass analysis that I don't talk about today, so the analysis of the system as such, is predominant, is preponderant in, uh, in, in, uh, uh, this, in defining what the impact of external stimuli is. So basically, all these systems behave as autopoietic systems, so reacting according to internal rules to external stimuli. Mm. This is very interesting. When it comes, from, uh, when it comes to the bottom-up influences, the situation is even more difficult. It was very hard for the expert we interviewed to identify if a specific country's perspective had an impact or not on the European game. Hmm? But <coughs> generally speaking, this impact is much more fragmented, harder to grasp, and no expert, not even from countries that traditionally are said to influence much European Union concept, like for instance, France, famous uh, Andreas Faludi quote, territorial cohesion is old French wine in new battles. They, never, they didn't report uh, high influence. All, count, all, all experts were quite uh, cautious in mentioning an influence of their own national perspective over how the European Union is developing. Anyway, what we try to do in the end is make a balance between the influence that are top down and bottom up. And we developed a typology of that, a typology of how countries are playing this Europeanization game. Eh? Countries' perspective are involved into making the, Europe the European Union territorial policy and being influenced by it. The majority of the country seems quite engaged, hmm? to a differential extent, but majority of the country seems engaged in trying to make a difference and uploading some specific priority on the European agenda and being much engaged and influenced by it, so truly taking on board European Union messages. Then there is a small group of countries that do not they say, do not receive much influence from the European Union, at least they don't perceive to be influenced in their territorial government as a special planning system, probably because more mature, but they perceive themselves as influencing the European territorial development model. Hmm? Then there is a group of countries, mostly in Central and Eastern Europe, that feel much more influenced than the way they can influence the game. This may problem of uh, situated learning, yeah? Like a community of practice, you roam around and little by little you move close to the circle and then in the end you may end up having an impact. And then there is a group of countries that is unengaged. This is quite normal for countries that are not part of the European Union but they were at stake in the study, like for instance Norway, Iceland, Liechtenstein and Switzerland. But it's also the game of some other countries, like for instance Lithuania said to behave like that. Okay, that's basically it. I think I went over my time. So last message. Overall, European territorial governance and the relation between top-down and bottom-up member state and European Union appears like very complex and non-codified, and this is important, process of vertical and horizontal relation. Yeah, there is a lot of room for cross-fertilization there. 
there is a lot of room and there are a lot of episodes that shows the synergies are exploited. Hmm? Again, we are talking about good practices of doing something in a specific way. Hmm? But because the fact there is no formal clarification of the relation between cohesion policy and territorial governance and special planning domestically, this is just episodic because there is a lot of freedom and not much guidelines on how to implement that. Cohesion policy in some countries implemented at the regional level with regional operational programs. Some other countries have only national operational program. So there is no common model, and probably we don't need a common model, but at least some formal clarification or some formal knowledge of the important relation between these two things, which are policies from the EU regulative, economic, discursive. And what happened in domestic territorial governance and special planning should be required in order to be more effective in exploiting this cost fertilization. Why this tool that I presented is relevant, last message. I don't know if it's relevant, we can discuss it together. One sign that is encouraging to me is that people start to talk about it. People start to talk about Compass and people start to ask us from the consortium that did Compass to present it. We were invited to present it at the National Territorial Cohesion Contact Point uh, meeting in Austria, that was a month ago, something like that. We are going to be presenting this to the Italian regions in a couple of, in a month or so. So there are groups of people that are decision makers and policy makers that are interested in the result of the process because there is probably genuine interest in how to exploit this cross fertilization, how to create synergies between what the EU is doing, how to create a, a positive sum game. So maybe this is the reason why I'm here to present this thing today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Giancarlo, uh, for this very concise presentation of, of the tool. I think it's very interesting look at the influences top down, bottom up on the, on the spatial planning systems. Uh, perhaps uh, maybe someone has a question uh, related to the presentation. Now it's the time to ask. No one? Maybe then I'll, I'll, I'll take a... <coughs> ah, there's a question here. Hi, thank you very much. Tim Moonan from the Business of Cities. Um, I'm just interested in the methodology and uh, what you feel are the strengths and limitations of the, the approach that you've used to, to try and capture this really interesting dialogical trend and what you would imagine would be the next stage of the evolution of ha adding different other kinds of ways to measure, capture these very complex processes. Yes, it does work. Okay. So, uh, we have the analytical model and it seems to work. Uh, I think the like uh, weakest link is probably the methodology for data collection, uh, the data we collected, because it is a, it is an ESPN project, there's a limited time span, it's limited in resources of course, so basically what we did is for, that for, for each country we had one expert that then was chained with a group of around uh, between three and uh, ten experts doing interviews on his own in focus groups. So the point is that uh, the knowledge that we have is partial. We didn't look into the practices ourselves. We have someone in each county that look into the practices. Mm -hmm. So there was a moment when uh, experts from every country needed to understand what we wa were asking to. And it was not only this relation, but also the complete analysis of the evolution of the system with or without European Union influences. So the point is we had a methodology, we needed to get people buying in our methodology, and then we needed these people to answer, to, to, uh, we needed to be lucky to receive homogeneous answers from everybody. So in some cases, it didn't happen. So we had to go back to the expert and ask for more clarification and so on. So I think we have good quality data, but it could have been much better. So I think next step would be to increase the time dedicated to collection of the data, because we did also a lot of time on analyzing the data we received, but and this is okay. But to increase the time for collecting the data to ask to more people. For instance, we have regionalized the country like uh, Italy or Spain or federal country like Germany, where special planning and territorial governance is very heterogeneous from one place to the other. And we couldn't really grasp that in our analysis. I mean, there is some, something about it, but we couldn't grasp it to the full extent. 
So I think this is the main problem. Thank you, Giancarlo. Um, now, uh, ah, yes, go ahead. We are short of time, but I think we, we, should, we should ask questions. Hi, now I'm um, Anders van Oort. I work at the uh, Flemish uh, Department for Environment and Spatial Development. I actually have <coughs> two questions, if I'm permitted. Uh, first question is really about the presentation. Well, um, you said there is less bottom-up influence than top-down influence, but do we actually need more bottom-up influence? And if yes, it's more of a rhetorical question. But if yes, how can we stimulate more bottom-up influence? And my second question is more related to um, the Flemish situation, because you were speaking of spatial uh, planning systems. But in Flanders, the um, no, that's not the question I want to ask. In Flanders, uh, we are merging spatial planning policy with environmental policy, and I'm wondering if in your research you have come across more countries or regions uh, merging those two policies uh, together, because I know, we know in the Netherlands they're doing the same thing, but I <coughs> don't know if there are any other countries in the EU uh, doing that at the moment. Thank you. Oh, okay. Yeah, thank you for your question. Uh, about the second question, uh, I'm afraid I'm not really good in answering that, in the sense that uh, we did find uh, everything and more in analyzing countries, and we did uh, try to figure out uh, how various issues get more or less integrated through time into special planning, and environment is one of those. So there are countries that are integrating environment into special planning more in these years. If uh, you ask me now which country, then I cannot say, and then you will probably have to read the report, which I assume is going to be published very soon. But about your first question that I find very interesting is, I don't know if we need more or less engagement. I know that we need uh, even opportunities of engagement for all the actors. I think this is very important. I think that there is no European policy without the engagement of the member yeah. state. I think that there are the member states that are shaping the European Union, that have been shaping the European Union for all time until now, and they keep doing that. But uh, there are, I'm not sure that there are, there is an even acknowledgement about the possibility of shaping and how to do that. It is, cle it is clear that uh, to find out uh, for our expert, uh, how a specific national perspective influences the European perspective, it is difficult. So probably this is one of the reasons why evidence show that uh, bottom-up influence is l much lower, or at least uh, more fragmented than top-down influence. But it is also true that uh, doing parallel research on this topic, I usually find that there are some countries that, that uh, are not feeling the added value of playing the game and trying to push issue on the agenda, while some other are. And to share at least uh, the message that proactively trying to negotiate in European Union and present your own topic without just uh, sitting, sitting on the fence or being refrained in doing so, it will be a positive game for everybody. More discussion and more debate of what happens there will also help European Union institutions to deliver better and more functional policy that in the ultimate analysis, do what uh, Andy Pike was saying this morning. So providing answers for all the European regions, differential answers, the place-based approach that Barker was advocating. Mm -hmm. I think this is what we need, but we need engagement from bottom up to do that.